So last time. Oh, I have an idea. I'm going to mute this video display. If I draw something up on the board, do you remember last time we did a broad overview of the field of psychology and the seven schools of thought, and we did a thumbnail sketch or a little, a little, um, a little brief description of each school, major school of thought in psychology. So I'm going to refer. Let's see. I'm wondering if I could draw a couple of things up here. What do you think? Who could fill it? Do you think, oh, oh, I have a question. Could one person fill in the whole chart without looking at your, your notes? I'm oh, sorry, I think you do a couple. Who thinks they could do the whole thing? Does anyone, before we start filling in, does anyone want to try to fill in the whole chart? Yeah? No. Uh, uh, oh my goodness, I know your name, and, I, and I don't tell me. Okay. Give me a sec, give me a, give me a chance. Don. Yes. Wow, I'm so happy. That, like, really, I'm asking you to fill all this stuff out. I can't even remember a name. <laughs> wow. Oh well. I'm sorry. Donna, I got it. Okay, Donna wants to try it, okay? And we'll, we'll see. Go ahead. What goes up top here? Oh. Psychology. It all, is it familiar? <laughs> what we're doing? Okay. All right, Don, go ahead. The seven schools or the. Well, what are these two? Um, what does that mean? It was clinical and research. Okay, so re these are the two types of psychology research and clinical. Very good. Wow. Good memory. And now, what does this mean? The seven schools of thought. Seven schools of thought. Cognitive, impressive. There's, there's neuroscience. Neuroscience, and what else would that be called? Another name? Biological psychology. Oh man! What's your name, please? Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> Omar, Omar, Omar. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. <laughs> Good, Omar. That's biological psych. Biopsych. That's what we're going to be talking about in depth very shortly. What's next? Uh, I know there's the behaviorism. Behaviorism, that's right. Very good. Nice memory. Humanism? Yeah. Yep. Uh, let me play humanism, sure. Humanistic psychology? Yeah. Uh, I know there's evolutionary. Yep, evolutionary. Psychoanalysis? Psychodynamic or psych yeah. psychoanalysis, which there's a little difference, which I'll tell you about one day. Yep, and one more. That's, that's, you did an outstanding job. Do you want someone to help you out? Yeah. Who knows the, the one last school of thought? It's the one that has to do with context. That is a, that would be a great interchangeable term for it, but it's not exactly it. But it, it, you, you are on to something more than you might know with that term. Go ahead. This is very close. I, I would give it to you if it were Jeopardy or something. Can you do cognitive? Cognitive up here. My handwriting is just mysterious. <laughs> you, 
you, it's socio, you got the first, like social, cultural, social, cultural. Oh, okay. Socio, cultural. So society and culture. That's it. Hey, really impressive. I, I'm not kidding. Like, I was thinking on the way here, maybe I'll put up the chart and see if any, I was thinking maybe the whole class could do that. I didn't think anybody was going to be able to do it. So good for you. Yeah, that's what, so you, you got it. Well, thank you. And hopefully it looked familiar to everyone else. Good job. Well, I'm very pleased with that. So today, um, oh, any questions or thoughts about any of that stuff, the seven schools of thought, the difference between clinical counseling and research psychology, the definition of the psychology, anything like that? Um, uh, little, I, I posted a video this morning on the Moodle that you can all watch to help you on the APA formatting for your first assignment. I would like to really impress upon you, and, I, and I'd like to know what your other professors are saying about the APA style. Are they discouraging you and telling you what I'm about to tell you? Don't use these automatic generators. Yeah, yeah they have, yeah. yeah. But really, like, I can't tell you all how often students use them and, and it doesn't and don't work and not correct. So please be careful with them. Don't, I would just suggest it's going to be much easier. Listen, with this class, with my assignments, what are you going to reference the book in my lecture? Well, if you do it right once, you don't have to keep writing it over and over again. I mean, I have practically taken this class, and I knew that I was going to have, well, how many other assignments there are that I have to do this referencing. I know the lecture's always going to be on there, and I know the textbook's always going to be on there. So I would like to make a template. I would open up a Word document and make a reference page and have it done and save it. Work, you know, show the assignment template and then write your paper and the template's there, the reference page. I, if I, I mean, make life easier on yourself. Um, the goal is to get you to be familiar with doing this properly so that when you go into an upper level class and you can do it easily. Um, remember this. There, don't, this page number stuff should don't, no page numbers in the references. Just very simple and very easy. And I'll put this display up and you can watch the video if you have any. Please work. You can watch the video if you have any questions. Well, let me show you where that video is, that little tutorial. I got the notification, which I was very, oh, I remember the name too. Ah, interesting. Uh, I got a notification that a student in here went to the writing lab and had the professional person help them on getting their assignment together. That's good. Man, that's smart business. That's good for you for doing that. I mean, I, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm the kind of person who's like always better safe than sorry. And I, even if it's like it's optional to go to the writing lab, I would, I would go to the writing lab. Let someone professional go over your paper with you, and then you, you submit it, and you, you know you're getting a good grade, good grade all automatically. You know, what does it take? It takes it means you can't wait till the last minute. Of course, that's the downside. You can't wait till the last minute to write it, to write it ahead of time, and then make an appointment to go into the writing lab. I would imagine. I, I unfortunately don't know how the writing lab works here, but or submit it online or whatever. It is. Uh, the other thing that you have to do is, of course, plan ahead. But those are good things in general to do. <laughs> so when you're coming in here, uh, the sign-in sheet is somewhere there. Um, when, when we look at this, I would come to, firstly, paper format and click on there. And this is going to tell you all the basic guidelines. They're the same for every, all, I'm sure they're very much similar for every APA reference class you have. Size 50, size 12 font. Always 
remember, I don't know why, but students love to do fancy stuff. Don't do anything fancy. No fancy odds. Times New Roman. That's the one I would say. Use Times New Roman. Size 12. Don't make the title bigger or smaller. Just size 12 for the whole thing. Times New Roman, those margins. You won't believe. Students sometimes they think, oh, I can suddenly turn one page into two pages if I make two inch margins instead of one inch margin. Like, some, like, your professor has never seen them before. No, like, you can't get away with anything like that. So just don't do it. The only thing that results in is you, you kind of like become that student to the professor. Oh, that student. They, they, they adjusted their margins to make, <laughs> to make it look like they're more worthy than that. Yeah. So, one inch margins, 12 font, times new Roman. Yeah, what else? Just so you at least have 500 words. Um, what's 500? That's, that's fine with me. Yeah, and you, should, you know you should always ask. That's a great thing you asked that because that, you know, some other professors might want you to try to just get it around 500. To me, I just wanted to make sure it's going to take at least 500 words to get this going. And remember, your reference page, your title page, you can't type that in. You know, if you get this whole document, because it shows on the software that I have on the grid, you know, it says how much it paid me on the word count. So if I see like 502 words for 500 words, and that's how many title page and reference page, you know, that's not good. Can I tell you something, and this is only true for me, I wouldn't say this is true for all professors. So I bring a lot of papers. I, I, I have a lot of papers. I, I'm teaching a course right now that has 70 students in it. And yes, last night at 6 p.m. papers were due. So I woke up this morning and there's 70 papers there to be graded. And this is another class. And that will be, now I'll have those all graded by Sunday morning. Sunday morning. So that means I have to do what, 10 a day? So I have to grade 10 a day. My experience, so I've seen a lot of papers. <laughs> over the years. My experience has been that the papers I see that like are this is I, I'm just I'm not I would not punish anyone for this. However, typically when I see a paper that has like five hundred and twenty words, it's indicative it's very seldom that, that, that the quality of that paper is a quality. And I, I'm not exactly sure why that is, but over the years I've noticed this. Then I'll see papers that come in, it's like you're saying, 1,000, 2,000, I mean, I get, for some reason, students, some students really get into an assignment, I can get two, three thousand words. Yeah, I think it's And it turns out that typically I find that those papers, if I just had to predict probability, typically those papers are over, are above and beyond in meticulousness, like in spelling and grammar in all the areas. I, I, so I'm just let, like throwing that out for, for thought. So someone who writes 500 words, and someone who writes 3,000 words, I both met the obligation. I don't give a higher grade than 3,000 words. However, I, in my experience, there seems to be correlation, a relationship between how many pages are there and the quality of the other aspects. I think writing is important. So it's, there's, if you, when you double space, so you page, papers have to be double space, of course, all those different papers. And the reason that this that you double space, in case you don't know why this is, is because it's easier for the professor to read. And we're looking at that screen and Together, it's more difficult to read them when the, when the lines are apart. Also, traditionally, when you when you look hand grade papers, like you know when you get papers on the printout, hard copies, it gave space where you could write in between. Like, oh, this is an interesting plot, blah blah blah. You know, 
So that's why to double space one page is about 250 words. So, this, so when you see that you have a 500 words, I promise you that by the end of this class, if right now two pages seems like a big deal, I think by the end of the class, we're at 250. Yeah, I can't even write an introduction in two pages, let alone full paper. So, um, I hope that's helpful too. Um, some other things that come to my mind off the top of my head. Write, like make sure if you don't know what to write, that means you have, your fruit's not right. You're trying to pick up right the fruit, you know? Like, you know the fruit on the tree? When it's ready, to, when it's really ripe, it like drops off the tree, you know? You don't have to pick it. It falls off and go, oh, you pick it up and you eat that sweetness, you know? That's what writing's like. You sit down and your papers, oh my goodness, what can I write? That means you haven't read enough yet, or you haven't thought about it enough yet. I promise you, if, and for two pages, you will have, you will, you will, you will take stuff out. That'll, you won't have room to, if, if, it's, if the fruit's right. You, you get what I'm saying by this right fruit stuff and writing? I get a little excited about writing. Why I have writing in my classes because I love to write. I consider myself a person and foremost a writer when it comes to that. I love to write. It helps me to get my thoughts out. It helps me to organize and work through the thoughts. So what I do when I write, if I were taking your, if I had your assignment to write a 250 word, 500 word, two page essay, I would, the first thing I'm going to say, okay, what's this first assignment? question is, what are three things that you thought were true about psychology that turns out after a few lectures are not true? So I'm going to take an easy one, one of our examples before. Psychiatry is not a psychology. These are two different things. A psychiatrist and a psychologist are two different things. So I would begin by saying, I, uh, in, in our class, there, there were, there, there, if this is true for you, I would say for myself in our class, I was introduced to a number of ideas that I was unaware of about psychology. Some things I did know, but I was unaware and mistaken about some aspects of psychology. And three of those things were one, two, three. You list your three things. And then Go in and you say the first thing that I mis was mistaken about psychology was that psychiatry is part of psychology. And Dr. Jordan mentioned in our lecture that psychiatry is a medical profession. That psychiatrists go to medical school and they follow something called the medical model, which is the disease model of the brain. So things like depression or any type of mental disorder is a result of either some kind of abnormality in the brain or chemical imbalance kind of ideas. Psychology, Dr. Judge mentioned, is largely this is based on the biopsychosocial model. And in addition to the biological possibilities, talk therapy is a big part of psychology, the psychological model, talking about how thinking can affect mood, your behavior, things of this nature. So off the top of my head, I may not have been very eloquent, but that could be, there could be, well, a paragraph or both. That could be like two paragraphs right there. You know, that's a page. You still have two more to describe. So after you go through and write all that, sit back and say, what do, you, what do I have here? What did I say? What you've written is the body of your paper. I see students try to write, start by writing the introduction, because isn't that what comes first? Yeah. However, you don't know, in the introduction, you're going to say what you're going to say. You don't know yet. You can't write your introduction if you haven't written the body of the paper, because you don't know what you're going to say yet. After you've written your paper, then go back and write the introduction. 
the assignment asks me to describe three aspects of psychology, to follow the three things in psychology in class that I thought psychology was or it turns out it's not. And then you have your introduction paragraph. And you, your body's written, and then what do you do for the conclusion? In the conclusion, you say what you said. The cliche, and I guess right now it's okay to do this. My, when, I, when you get to graduate school, maybe an upper level class will tell you don't do this because it's too common. In this paper, I have discussed, you know, that's your conclusion. In this paper, we looked at if you can avoid saying, starting your conclusion off giving this paper, it's probably going to be, you don't have to, you can do this if you want, but be aware that everybody knows you in this paper, you know, that's like a cliche for a conclusion. At this level, since it's your first class doing this, you know, intro class, you can, you can do that. I'm not going to take points off of it, but you, you stylistically, you might see as you go on and read journal articles and whatnot in your other classes, or you, know, you might say, ooh, I like the way they went to the conclusion, and you might make that part of your bag of tricks, you know? Like a jazz musician learns different licks from, you hear some Miles Davis that does something, you say, ooh, I like that. And maybe you do something in your own way that was based on that idea. You can stylistically. That's how I would go about the writing. And remember this in referencing. The reason you reference is because plagiarism is a serious, serious business. Plagiarism means writing in a way that suggests that you're right, that the ideas you're presenting are yours, but in fact they're not yours. They're somebody else's. So the reason we reference is to be honest, mostly. But also, if I'm reading a paper and I'm not familiar, I wonder where the, you know, where they got that information. I want to read more about that idea. It tells me where to go to read more. I'm both Um, any questions or thoughts? Yeah, Nehemiah. Yes. How do you like that? That's awesome. Thank you very much. Jolia. Jalia. Uh, close. <laughs> yes. That's a great question. So we just went all these basics. I'll go back to another tab to answer that question. Here's a video I made this morning. APA referencing for very beginners. See, very beginners. Here I am talking to you. I don't hear it. Well, here I'm describing this. So this is the website that you will... pa.apa.org And my if voice. you're so inclined, you can... We have all kind of products here, seventh edition now available. So I'm going to fast forward to what you're saying. This, through these, um, this will show you how to reference style. Um, I'm including the title page up. Firstly, paper format, title page setup, fonts, headings, margins, line spacing. It's going to tell you everything you need to know uh, about the paper format. Order of pages, title page setup, the font, page header, line spacing, margins everything that you want, black color. <laughs> so we begin the order of pages, uh, we begin with a title page. So here's the sample title page. And if you notice, it will, I'll put the link will be up there too. You're absolutely right. It's the title, it's centered. This page is, it's centered and the title all size 12 font of Times New Roman. And you see it's bold. You bold the title, you put your name, then you put your affiliation, 
Centenary University, the, the class that you're in, our class. Uh, my, who I am, you, you can look on the syllabus if you forget who I am. You know, my name's there, G-I-O-E-I, Jovi. And then the date, due date. That's it, that's the title. I, if I, if I, I wouldn't even notice that. But, so I, so that's a great, it's a, you don't have to be like that, may I say, neurotic. Okay, <laughs> like, right. Exactly. Like that, I mean, I'm not going to take a point off, oh, it's, it should have been the 16th, and you put the 15th. No, of course not. But you might not do it right. <laughs> but I'm not going to penalize you. But, yeah. So that's what a, so this whole video goes through that whole, that whole thing. So I'm not going to waste your, you know, our class time. This is, this goes through everything. Um, here is how to construct the, the reference page. Click on that, and this will take you to the APA page that. Uh, If anything doesn't take you there, like I noticed Moodle has some kind of weird thing, um, I always put the link right below it, and that, that'll take you there. I don't know why the Moodle link URL stuff doesn't work, but look at this. This tells you all you need to know about reference list. And I have another link here for in-text parenthetical referencing. I'd like to um, just show you something, because there's some things that students, uh, again, this is one of those things that students, the mis a, a mistake that students do, I don't know why, bless you, but the period comes after the parenthetical reference. This is where I tell you, you'll see, I get, you'll see that if you use those auto generators, they start putting page numbers in here. And that's, that's wrong. It's simply a per, per, or parentheses, the last name, a comma. Students miss the comma quite a bit. So make sure you put your comma in. The year of the publication, you find all that stuff in the very front of the, in the, very front of the book. And then you close the parentheses. And here's the mistake I see so frequently. Students put the period at the end of the sentence, and that's not correct. You always put the punctuation period at the end of everything. So those are, um, so here are the two big mistakes I see very, very frequently. With 400 level students, I see this. They forget the comma between the last name and the year, and they forget that the period goes after the parent, that this is called a parenthetical reference. There's a, I would suggest just using that format for your first paper. When you get Familiar with that? It's easy. Then you can try this other one. Where's that at? Narrative style. That's where you can. Here's narrative style. You see, the person used the author's last name as part of the sentence, and then after the last name, then they just put the year in parentheses. It's a stylistic, it shows your reader that you're a little more fluid with how to do it, you know. You, you can choose either of those, just so it's reference. Oh, here's another big one that I that I see. I, a big error that I see on the reference page. I did it again on the reference page. I will simply go APA reference page. Uh, this is this is what an a, a good APA reference page looks like. Like this is visually how it looks, and you'll notice what's up at the top, centered. The word references. 
I can, can't tell you how frequently students write bibliography or works cited and um, that those aren't correct. In APA, it's always references, plural, with the S on the end, not just reference, but references. Um, in my experience, those um, are the, oh, and you would alphabetize. Last name, you know, the first reference is to the one with alphabetical order. Um, those are the big mistakes that I always, that I would warn you against. So questions or thoughts? Any ideas or questions about that? Is that? So it's important, and I tell you up front, I, I have to do my job. And that means I'm going to be tough on it, okay? So just remember, I, I know what it feels like. Believe me, I know what it feels like because I've written books and I've my heart, it's miserable when you put your heart into something and then you send it off to the editor and you get your, from the publisher and you get your book back and you don't even recognize yourself in it anymore. They've removed everything that was me out of it, you know. I know that feeling so intimately and I get angry and I curse and I, I'm angry. For, but ultimately, most of the time, the editor knows better than um, the person who used to do all my proofreading, unfortunately, passed away. But uh, I found him after years of writing, and I trusted him. So he, I would write, and then he would take my writing and make it brilliant. I'd say, oh my goodness, I wish I could write like this. But he, he, he said, suggested, I trusted him so much that it was easy to take his criticism. Um, just remember, I'm going to be tough. So please, just trust me that I'm trying to help you to be the best you can be at this for this long. I'm not over, overly, you know, it's not going to be ridiculous, but um, don't be upset if you don't get an A. Chances are you won't get an A in the first few years. I mean, you will, I don't know, but just don't, don't uh, take, I, I, it's a, it may be impossible, I don't know. Try not to take it. Try to just trust me that I'm going to help you. And, that'll be and remember, don't get worried. I see students get so worried. Um, remember, a, a hundred and a ninety or an A doesn't make no one knows the difference. It's not. Do they use pluses and minuses here at the seminary? Plus and minus, a plus a minus a. But so in other words. Whether you graduate the top of the class or your bottom of the class, you're still called doc. No, don't get caught. Don't waste your time and energy worrying about five points. And that five points, I mean, if that five points is the difference between an A and a B, well, then maybe you should, you know, put some energy into it. But if you're talking like the difference between a 95 and a 100, please save yourself. It's not worth it. It's like an A is an A. <laughs> you know, don't sweat it. You know, it's, like, it's the same thing. I see that happen. Okay, any uh, anything that you'd like me to answer? For um, citing a lecture, like in-text citation counts, because I think I'm a I believe that it will be in the in-text, that's a good question, in the in-text citation, uh, you're catching me. I haven't, this is the first I've been in the classroom in years. <laughs> so I'm used to a video lecture. I know how to say a video lecture. Uh, I would say in this, in our, in, in our lecture, Joby, and then uh, put, just like say Joby, and then just put the year, uh, put the last name on the year. I think that's going to be good. Let's see. Let's look what they say here. See if we can find. That's I'm a, sorry, I'm asking you. No, no, I think that's an excellent question, and um, it's good you ask, because I don't know. I, I, I don't know, I didn't, um, I, I'm not prepared for it. So APA style, so we're gonna look here, basic principles, uh, parenthetical. It doesn't tell us there. Parenthetical. 
paraphrasing, uh, remember, it's a bad idea to do direct quotes. Don't do direct quotes. If you have something you want to quote from the book, put it in your own words and then reference it. Direct. The reason I tell you this is when professors see a paper and they see direct quotes, and half the paragraph is the quote from a book, it looks like someone's trying to take up space, <laughs> meet the word count by using someone else's words. So you can use someone else's thoughts in your own words, and then you're legit. You know, then you're being legitimate. It just shows more integrity. You might not realize that that's that's how professors are thinking. You know, um, this is a great question. Each work cited should be in the reference list. If you would just say in the lecture, Joby mentioned. Yeah, that's good. That's good, but now we have to put it in the on the reference page. So I don't want to do it on the on the reference page. You do? Page. Yeah, that's easy. I just Oh good. How do you do it? Because I don't know. I'm I'm not being I I don't I don't know. So here's works including a reference list. Oh, uh, here's a, another interesting thing that I should mention. Uh, students are often Now, I'm not at the right web page because there was a. Here it is. Um, textual data and assessment audiovisual online. Maybe it's on audiovisual. Do you know how to do it? Then you I can have to. Where do you where do you find or where did you find this? No, I I like Google and, and like look at examples. This is where I got it. Where did you Oh, that's good. Can you send that to me? Yeah. Can you email it to me? I'll put that up to show in the class. That's a great question. I'm, I apologize. I don't off the top of my head know how to do that. I've never done it. Thank you very much. I'll share that with everyone. So this website will, will be very helpful for you. All right, any other questions, thoughts, or ideas, concerns? You should, uh, you should be good. Well, and this video I made will be basically say everything I just said and repeat in repetition. Oh, what I wanted to mention to you was students often confuse the difference between APA reference style and an APA publication style. So APA publication style includes APA reference style, but APA publication style is preparing the document for a publisher to print in a journal or a magazine or all that. So that reference style is the title page, the reference page, and the in-text citations. That's all you have to worry about. Stuff like running head, you'll see this, APA style, running head, that you don't have to do that kind of business. That's for publications. And we're not publishing that. So don't save yourself. I'm helping you to save yourself unnecessary work because that's my concern. Just title page, reference page, and in text citations. Good? All right. Let's talk about our topic. I want to tell you now about this thing, how research is done. In psychology. How research is done in psychology. We're going to be a little flexible with the syllabus schedule because obviously today already we're supposed to be starting bio, biological psychology chapter two, but because I am not used to starting on with the Labor Day week, 
I miscalculated, so I'm like a lecture off. I'm also not used to going around the classroom, so I'm too, remember the first day we went around and got to know each other? I usually walk in and start lecturing, so I'm actually two days off, but I've been my best. We have a long semester, so we won't take these away, we won't miss it. So this is, when we talk about that first word in psychology, the definition of psychology, if you remember, the definition is the scientific, the scientific study of behavior and the mind. Remember this? And the word scientific is the word we're going to look at today very closely. Scientific. The word science. The word science won't get you bogged down in this until you take history of psychology one day. I teach you, I'll tell you that history of the word science. You, if I ask you, what do you what comes to your mind if I say the word science? I would imagine in your mind right now, you're probably seeing white lab coats and Bunsen burners and liquid bubbling and mathematical formulas and that kind of stuff. Maybe even computers or something like that. The word science originally in its oldest Latin etymology means the acquisition of knowledge. Scientia is the word. You don't have to write this down, just enjoy it. <laughs> but the acquisition of knowledge. What does that mean? You can acquire knowledge in a conversation. You can acquire knowledge in a movie. You go to the movie and if you're depressed, and you go to a film that has to do with someone dealing with depression or read a novel, you might learn something from that film about your own self. That's the acquisition of knowledge. In a way, poetry can be scientific, the acquisition of knowledge. You see, when you read old texts, or the original sense of the word science, it simply means the acquisition of knowledge. But in the contemporary 20th, 21st century, since around the year 1600, there's a reason for this, you'll learn one day in the future in the history, the history of this word, around the year 1600, science started to mean what you're thinking of it in your mind now. Empirical, observable, and measurable. So I'm going to write down three words, empirical. And when you see this word empirical or empiricism, it simply means, these are theoretical words that simply mean you can observe it, you can taste, smell, hear, see, feel, it's observable, and it's measurable. Inches, centimeters, pounds, pounds, uh, kilograms, volume, mass, all those things, is that better? All those things, that's measurable. So whenever you see the Word empiricism, in our sense of the word, it means it's observable and measurable. And these are very, very important aspects of this thing we call today science. And remember again, psychology is the science, the scientific study of behavior and the mind. You see, I keep wanting to go back to the definition I learned, behavior and mental process, that pause of the mind. <laughs> so observable and measurable. You can simply think, maybe I haven't done this in a long time, so I can't remember what it is, but maybe you look up the etymology of empirical, and that might help you remember the word empirical. I don't know what it is. But it come, mean the information comes through this, one of the sensory organs. Skin, eyes, tongue, nose, and ears. Sensory. So there's this thing that we now have, was established. People in the 1600s were trying to figure out how to get to knowledge. And that and what began was the Enlightenment or the, the scientific revolution. People like Rene Descartes was trying to figure out how to come to definite knowledge. Trustworthy ideas. The predominant light before this was the religion. In the West, in Europe, where Rene Descartes was and Emmanuel Kant was this was Roman Catholic Church was the authority on how you got knowledge. No 
other places of the world with these other traditions. And in the scientific revolution, the Enlightenment in the 1600s, this began, and by the 1700s, the Enlightenment period was very much in its full swing. That's when science became empirical. Now you might remember back to why psyche switched around that year from soul to mind. You see, historically, what was going on, they said, oh, soul sounds like the Roman Catholic Church. Mind, oh, that sounds more like science, empiricism. So we have observable and measurable. And a method of science was started. Now here's the, the thing about the method, the scientific method. The scientific method, it's presented and talked about like it's this thing. And the truth is, if you study chemistry, or if you study, go to biology class, or you just go to classical mechanics and physics, study Newtonian physics, then you go to theoretical physics, then you go to sociology class, then you go to psychology class, everybody's going to be talking about this scientific method, and it turns out they're all talking about something different. And that's one of the criticisms that humanists, humanistic psychology has of this, that there is no real method of psychology of science, but it's talked about as if there is. So what I have done is come up with a little story, a little metaphor, I guess, to help you to understand what is meant by this idea of the scientific method. And then the punchline is it turns out that everybody's doing the same thing in a lot of science if you follow this story of how it works. So I like to think of the scientific method like a portal wall. Now, what happens if you're in a court of law? If you're a lawyer, you have an argument. You're defending or you're pro prosecuting someone, and you put together a defense or prosecution. You put together an argument, an idea. And then you get up in front of the courtroom, and you try to sell that idea to jurors and a judge, right? Or just a judge, or maybe jurors whichever the court is, and the person who wins is the person who is the most skilled at putting together a convincing argument. You, we all know this from watching, just, or watching court proceedings. Justice turns out it's a very slippery thing, and justice usually goes to the person who had the most effective lawyer in organizing and doing their homework and putting things I will suggest to you that science is no different. This idea that I give to you that science is a result of a very skillful presentation and organization of information comes from a theoretical scientist with the last name of KUHN, Thomas Kuhn. I'm teaching a model of the scientific method that was, that's, was developed by Thomas Kuhn. Now you all, this is much more than you'll need to know now, but I would like you to be, at least hear the name in your ears so it's not unfamiliar one day when you hear it again. You'll say, oh, wait, that's I. Yeah, Thomas Kuhn. He wrote a book in 1963, I believe, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Not just psychology, but all science. And this is the model, of this, this sort of model of science we're getting from him, the idea that argument, how how sound and and, and uh, proof, how much proof you have, how successful you are in putting together your argument is the thing that matters. So if the if the lawyer giving the argument is the scientist, writing the paper or giving the presentation, the judge or the jury, who is that? Those are other scientists. In scientists, in science, we call those people peers. A peer, you may have heard of a peer review journal. Well, a peer is someone else who has authority or knowledge on what you're talking about. A judge is a good example because you know in juries, you don't know who's on a jury. They might have knowledge or no knowledge. As a matter of fact, if they have a lot of knowledge, they probably won't be selected to be on the jury, ironically. But in science, the jury or the judge are the peers, and those peers are going to listen to your argument, and 
they're going to decide whether they agree or disagree. And if they agree, you got it. If you show enough evidence, if you have a successful style of writing and arguing your idea, and they say yes, it then gets published. And then other articles will get published in reaction to that article. And it becomes what we call a discourse, a dialogue. So when you write an article, you might be participating in a dialogue, a discourse, a conversation that's been going on for four or five hundred years. You may have, you might be participating, like a current researcher in neuroscience, say, biological psychology, could be continuing a conversation that's been going on since the 1930s or early 1900s or the 1800s or even before. Typically, it's long before that. You're just the most recent person conversing. So when I hear the scientific method, I think of a lawyer presenting an argument, evidence, observable and measurable evidence, empirical evidence, to a judge, a jury of peers, other scientists, and they decide yes or no. Yes, this is going to be published and entered into the conversation, or no, go put it on your blog. <laughs> Now, we live in a day and age, interestingly, where putting it on a blog might have more social influence than getting it into the peer review article. What's the risk and danger of this? Well, the risk and danger of this is people who don't know how to make sound, who don't know enough, read it and it sounds like a good idea and they get carried away with it. And that's how we come up with things, misinformation. And it leads to deaths. Perhaps an example of that would be this resurgence that's going on right now. Um, with polio in New York City. Individuals who may be very convincing, but not having passed their ideas to a jury of peers, present their information on, say, blogs or on the internet, and people who do not know enough to know how to really interpret what's being said, buy into it, and the next thing you know, there's trouble. Um, if there were examples of successes, I would give them to you. I don't know those successes. But unfortunately, I don't know the disasters of this process. There is one interesting thing. Do you know, have you learned yet in your classes that you're not supposed to use Wikipedia as a reference? You've all learned this. Don't use Wikipedia. That's very true. However, I'm going to tell you a secret. When I'm doing research, the first place I look is Wikipedia. Never put it in my reference page. So I'm going to repeat that because I don't want you to this. I never, I admit this to all of you, but I never mention it in the research paper. I never put it in the reference page because that's a sure sign of getting your work directed, or dismissed. But what do I do? I look to see what the radicals are saying, what the people are saying that have not gotten through the gatekeepers yet. Because sometimes they have something that's avant-garde, ahead of the game. Sometimes there's something that they're, you see, when you publish something in a peer-reviewed journal, it might be two years old. Research is done, and by the time it actually gets published, it might be two years later. In Wikipedia, that idea could be up there immediately. So what I do is, I, I look at the researchers that know their stuff, I go to their web pages, and often they have stuff published on their web page that you can you take and use with caution to get you thinking. Look at Wikipedia to get you thinking, but never use it as evidence because you'll get shot down. Did, did I make sure everybody's not going to use it with also telling you that it can be of value? I've found really valuable things. It leads me in, this is an example of how I've done it. I'll look at the Wikipedia, and you know, Wikipedia has its own reference list. So you can then go there, and you might find that an idea that appears in Wikipedia also, they got the idea from a really legitimate source. Now you go to that legitimate source, that journal, a peer reviewed journal, that you can reference. You just have to be smart about it. You, know? Did you have something to say. Did you? Uh, there was no, a question. I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying how, I was going to say how uh, Evelyn and I might be exploring the cheaper costs that I have because some kids would have like, trouble finding like, legitimate articles. So she told us to go on Wikipedia and scroll down. Reference. That's it. 
So please remember forevermore, Dr. Joby tells you never put that in the reference page. However, in the spirit of William James, the radical empiricist, well, I'm going to tease you more about him as the course goes on because he's one of my other role models, William James. He was the founder of the Ameri American psychology. William James was a radical empiricist, and what radical empiricism for him his was look into all available information, but do so wisely. See, if you're going to look at somebody's personal website or Wikipedia, you already know you can't use it on your reference page. And you also know that it takes even extra scrutiny, more responsibility, because you really have to think, because there wasn't a jury of peers helping you to say this is good or bad, this is useful or not useful. Scientific method. Like a court of law, if you, do, if you have enough evidence, if you organize that evidence effectively in your paper or in your oral presentation, you then can convince the jury of your peers that it's good enough, it's legit enough to get published, and now you're in the conversation. Is that, so when you hear that term, scientific method, that's really the, what they're talking about, as far as I can tell. <laughs> because, like I said, I sat through, I happen to enjoy physics quite a bit, and I sometimes take a class in physics because for fun, because I like it. And when they present, boy, stuff goes on in theoretical physics that would never go on in psychology science. I'll give you an example of something to think about. In psychology, the king of all some of research methods is the experimental method, which I'm about to tell you about. Albert Einstein never did one experiment. Albert Einstein did not conduct an experiment. You see how interesting it is when it's between different disciplines? This is why it's very difficult to say what is. He did thought experiments. If I were traveling at the speed of light on a train, the light went on. That's not an experiment. You can't. There's no train that goes the speed of light that you're going to ride on and switch on a switch. And, I mean, this is all thought experiments. If you would do that in psychology, it wouldn't get published. But Einstein could do it in physics. Isn't, I think that's amazing that the standards between of what one considers to be science shifts from discipline to discipline. But what doesn't shift is the court of law analogy. You still have to give a convincing argument. Questions or thoughts? Here are the steps. These are the steps. Again, this is outlined in Thomas Kuhn's text, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, which is a book. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is a book that you will eventually be getting not in their grad and graduate school. And it's an interesting book. The, the idea is this. Uh, this order is slightly different than in your textbook, but I think you'll understand why in a second. The first thing that happens is this. You get an idea. Now, how do you get an idea? Maybe someone in here is, has an idea that, they want, that they're going to want to do research on. I had an idea in master's degree. I had to write, I had to do research. And I decided to do experimental research, which you'll understand shortly. And I did a lot of reading. I love art. And I loved it. I find, and keep this in mind for one day when you take a research design class, find something you're really interested in, and you really love to read about, and it won't be work. It'll be fun. So I had to do experimental research for my master's degree thesis. And I'm not an experimental psychologist. The way I do psychology is very different from, which I'll tune you into a little bit as we show the different methods. However, experimentation is something that you really have to do if you're going to get graduate with like a PhD or a, a master of arts in psychology. You're going to have to do this at some point. So you have to prove that you know what you can do. Then after you know it, then you can reject it. <laughs> well, that's it. Don't reject something before you don't know what it is. 
Uh, so I just I, I love art, and in particular I love painting, and visual art, I love music. And there was a question I was very interested in. The question was, what is so interesting about the Mona Lisa? You all know the Mona Lisa, the painting. I'm going to put it up here for you to see. You know it's on the Moodle. I'll put an image up here for you. If you look at the Mona Lisa, like, why would the Mona Lisa be worth it? Uh, that's a whole other story, but why should the Mona Lisa be more famous than anything else? Like, why this? What's so interesting about it? Like, you go to the Louvre, and this thing's behind bulletproof glass, and it's worth who knows how much money this is worth. Why this painting and not some other painting? Like, what's so special about this? This is called the Acom Art there's a lot of answers to the question that I just gave. What makes it valuable? What makes it popular? Well, maybe just the fact that, maybe just the um, idea that it's on so many coffee mugs and postcards makes everybody excited. Got to see the Mona Lisa. And then there's something maybe much more interesting or beautiful right next to it to an individual, but they ignore that because this is the popular thing. I don't know, but this is what I do know. It's super popular. And what makes it most interesting to people, anyone know what makes this interesting to people? In, in art, visual, aesthetically, yeah. I think people see like what did she smile in the or they're what? trying to debate what it is. That's it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to do with the eyes as well. This is incredible. You, so you are keeping your clue in this. The big mystery about this, you're, you're absolutely right. The big mystery about this is. What's this all about? Is this a smile? Is it straight-faced? It's the word's ambiguity. No one's really sure. As a matter of fact, when you ask people what they're seeing, they see different things. It's a rather peculiar facial expression. Now, you both are hitting, you guys are both hitting on something very interesting here that I'm going to tell you about. My question, I had to come up with a research project what I could do research on. And I wanted to do it on something that, a question that I was interested in. And the question that I thought, well, maybe this would be interesting. Why, is, what's the facial ambiguity, facial expression, ambiguous facial expression on the Mona Lisa all about? So the first, to even get a question, I had to be, what, curious. <laughs> I had to go and be introduced to something. I don't know what you're all curious in, but that's a good place to start. If you're curious in video games, there's some research to be done. If you're curious on love, there's some research to be done. If you're curious in the ambiguous facial expression of the Mona Lisa, you can write that for your master's thesis. So I then, so the first thing I did was come up with a curious an idea. I then read what neuroscientists have to say about it. And the person who was the most famous researcher, I went to the library, put in a search engine, Mona Lisa, cognitive or neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and I found out that this lady, Margaret Livingstone, at Harvard University, had proposed and was considered the authority as to what the ambiguous facial expression was on the Mona Lisa. And Nathan, are you familiar with this? Because you, you, you did. Yeah, wow. Um, I actually like, uh, studied out in my art class. Okay. Like in my junior year. About like, I don't actually really know about art, but about like how like, the deception, like making the things she's like looking at you wherever you're sitting. Depending on where you're looking at the face. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this is Livingstone's argument. Livingstone is a biological neuroscientist. Remember that store thought? And she used something called eye tracking device. So if the person put their face in and hold, remember, because we want to be observable and measurable in science, we want evidence. The person's, her hypothesis, her educated idea, was that depending on where you looked at the face, you would get a different impression of what the facial expression was. That, she said, was due to the high cheekbones. Because when we smile, our cheeks rise. 
So if our eyes are looking at the forehead, if that's what we're focused on, the forehead, in our, in our peripheral vision, we're seeing just the raised cheekbones, and we're interpreting that as a smile. So some, this is interesting, some folks have high cheekbones without even smiling. They just naturally have high cheekbones. And that can be a subtle influence on how we perceive they're feeling, bro. They're acting. So Livingstone did set up an experiment to test her hypothesis. Her hypothesis was that the high cheekbones were the things that gave us this the impression that she was smiling, and that if the person focused at the forehead so that the lower part of the vision couldn't see below the cheekbones, they would interpret it as smiling. So she put, that's her hypothesis. I'm going to write that up here. I almost wrote it on this machine. So that's, can I write it over here? That's her idea, her hypothesis. Hypothesis, it's one word. Hypothesis. Hypo, hyper means above, hypo means below. Hypodermic means a needle below the skin, hypodermia. Hypothermia means below the, the temperature, thermal near the body. Hypothesis, hypothesis. I think of this as an educated guess. It's someone who's done their homework and came up with an idea. Right? So her hypothesis is, if you look, so she, so she painted, uh, she showed an image of the Mona Lisa with an X on the forehead, use eye tracking devices to make sure that the eyes were focused not down, but up at the top of the forehead, and then did a questionnaire, what is the facial expression? And she found that the majority of people who focused on the forehead said it was a smile. There's a hypothesis. She tested the next step, so she came up with an idea, an educated idea, she then tested the hypothesis. That's called research method. Her research method was using eye tracking device to see where the eyes were looking and a questionnaire to find out what the person's interpretation was of the image based on where they were looking. She tested the hypothesis and then she came up with evidence for her hypothesis Successfully, she showed that this was rep that this could be done, that you could predict someone's interpretation of the facial expression based on where they were looking on the face. And that is when the hypothesis raised up to become a hypo theory. It became a theory. A theory, so in other words, when you hear people say, oh, I have a theory about that. No, they don't have a theory about that. They have a hypothesis. You can't have a theory until you have evidence. Observable and measurable evidence. Where is the word? Empirical evidence. And of course, how do you get that? Well, you use certain methods that we're going to talk about. Very convincing, isn't it? If I were in a court of law and I was presenting this evidence, would you be convinced of it that we solved the mystery? I'll show you that 90% of people, when focusing on the forehead, see a smile and not straight face, and therefore the high cheekbone is about 90%. That's a pretty strong evidence that I can present. Uh, that's very convincing. And I was very convinced until I, I learned that after five, six hundred years, Leonardo da Vinci's Latin notebooks were being published in English. I just want to tell you about Leonardo da Vinci because he was a painter. He was a genius. He would write in his so much that he would write in two hands at once on two different topics going in two different directions. So you have to actually use a mirror to read one half of a page. The guy was a genius. One of the most incredible thinkers ever with Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, his notebooks were translated from Latin to English. And I went to the Met Museum of Art where they are on display, and I saw the original notebooks, and I bought a copy of the English translation and started reading them. They were filled with all kind of interesting things. 
And all of a sudden, I find in his notebooks that he says, the secret to the Mona Lisa, the secret to the ambiguity of the Mona Lisa is that the corners of the eyes and the corners of the mouth are you painted with a technique in Italian, the word is sfumato. Sfumare is to smoke, like sfumo, smoke a cigarette. Sfumato is to smoke, to blur. He claims in his notebooks that he blurred the corners of the mouth and the corners of the eyes so that, and he, and he made the blur at a certain angle that suggests, suggests this, that there could be a smile, but it's not definitive. Could be, it could be. Now here we have a very interesting situation. We have a neuroscientist who came up with exact evidence to show that it had to do with cheekbones. And we have Leonardo who's saying, out of a painter's mouth, it has to do with the sfumato technique, the ambiguity, the ambiguity of the parts. And then I start reading, and I said, well, who knows about to see you go down, you know how you go down the rabbit hole when you're on Google? <laughs> you say, oh my goodness. And you're one thing after another. Well, I'm in the rabbit hole at this point. And I'm wondering, well, who's the who's the authority of facial expression? Oh my goodness. I just am having one of these moments where I'm getting old. <laughs> and what is always I told you I'm gonna have to start using notes. What was what has always been there and was first thing, and now it's gone. It's all can someone look up the psychology of facial expression? It's Paul K. His last name starts with a K. Can someone help me? I'm sorry. Boy, I used to be so, I used to be able to just start talking. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to have to get notes. Paul Krugman. Krugman. Paul Krugman. K-U-K-R-U-G-M-A-N. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I feel, give me another, how, how many, how long do you think I have before I'll even lose the Paul? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> Two semesters from now. Who are you? Paul Krug. He's the authority on facial expressions. And you know that one in this class today. He discovered, he did a lot of empirical research and found that there were a limited number of facial expressions. Joy, surprise, anger, fear, and happiness that are universal no matter what culture you're in. I went to India, and I said to the person, is this the correct change? They said, yes, it is. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? Well, interestingly enough, as I come to find out, in India, when people are saying no, the head goes this way, when you're saying yes, it goes this way. But that's not true. So facial expressions, too, can change. As a matter of fact, neuroimaging can change from culture to culture, where happiness or contentness or anger, all this stuff, Curves and brain is culturally influenced. It's really confusing. When you, you grow up in you know, the United States versus growing up in Haiti or something like this, it could be differences. So Paul Krugman, his research shows exactly what Leonardo said. Facial expression or interpretation of facial expression comes from the corners of the mouth and the corners of the eyes. And he did this through repeated, that was his hypothesis tested his hypothesis over and over and over again, and it became a theory. Now, when you have enough confidence that a theory is always 100% correct, that is when science says it becomes, you know this, a law. In physics, classical mechanics, we have laws. Newtonian physics, laws of thermodynamics, laws of motion, laws of gravity, would anyone like to venture a guess at how many walls the science of psychology has? You want to know? How many things in the science of psychology are true regardless of space and time? No matter where you are or when you are, it's true, like gravity <laughs> or walls of thermodynamics. Does anyone know? This should this you probably know the answer and you're afraid to say it. There is none. There are none. You got it. We have no laws. You hear the word law. There's one law that was talked about by behaviors. 
back in the 30s, but it turns out that it's not really a law. It's just used for word. So the idea that he came up with was that if you reward somebody, you give somebody a reward directly after one thing, his laws were done by stated that that will increase that behavior. But where does it become problematic? Well, it becomes problematic because some people like getting punished. <laughs> For getting spanked is not always punishment. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? I, I give you tickets to the opera, you might be like, oh, thanks. And someone might be, oh, wow, I've always wanted to go to the opera. You know, I love the opera. In, in human condition, stimulus and response isn't too clear cut because there's an O in between. There's an organism. <laughs> this works with billiard balls, you know, pool, table, and physics, but in psychology we have S O R. Stimulus response from what's in the middle, the organism, the individual, and their likes and dislikes. Okay, so you're getting the feel of how you can find uh, this is research that I did, and I had a question now. How my hypothesis is, who's right? And I was putting my money on Leonardo. Because, why? Well, I like Leonardo da Vinci. That's my bias, and I was writing the article. So, but I didn't word it in this way. I worded, and plus, I also read Paul Krugman, who's the authority on this, saying exactly what Leonardo was saying. So, I decided my hypothesis was that I was going to investigate whether or not Livingstone was correct or Leonardo was correct. So I start, so I set up, so that my hypothesis was that although there's evidence to suggest that by Livingstone, and this is why you have to reference, you know, I put Livingstone, comma, 1996, end parentheses, period, you know, I did all this stuff you have to do. Put her at the end of the reference page. Uh, um, although Livingstone has has considerable empirical evidence that where you look at the face determines on how you interpret the facial expression, Krugman and Leonardo da Vinci himself claim that the secret is wearing corners of the eyes and corners of the mouth. So now I have to do research. I have to do research. How am I going to do research? You have to be really smart in doing this research. I have to test my hypothesis to come up with evidence for the research. Before I tell you how I did my research, I want to turn you on to something very interesting. Remember this funny word I told you about phenomenology, that existential phenomenological psychology, the one that you won't read about in your book that I am in love with and I've been studying now for the past decade? Well, the phenomenological research is the scientists are very skeptical about what I'm going to teach you to do right now, but I want you to know it exists because I think it's fascinating. The phenomenologist said, would say, if I were going to set this up as an experiment or as a research project today, I would use the phenomenological method. Look at this Mona Lisa. I want you all to take a look at this Mona Lisa's face. Now, I'm not going to look at you because I don't want to interfere with you. I don't want to embarrass you, but really, look at this face, and I want you to do two things introspect and become aware of how you are feeling while you're imitating your facial expression. Now I want you to imitate that facial expression that you see, that ambiguous kind of thing, like do it physically. And when you're physically doing it, uh, be aware inside of what your emotional response is to that feeling. I'm going to do it. I get a feeling. I get an emotion. Do you? That's phenomenological research. You would then write about that feeling. Or you would have subjects, 40 subjects, 100 subjects, do that, and then write about the responses and say how many people said. Now, when I, I won't tell you what I feel. Now, out of curiosity, what do you feel? What did you feel when you did this? Do you feel anything you can identify, an emotion, when you imitated the facial expression? Weird. What's that? Weird. weird. Can you, that, I, I agree with you. What do you mean by weird? Just weird, is it funny to it? Gives you a weird feeling? Yeah. An ambiguous feeling? Um, strange feeling? I'm not sure why. What? 
not sure. Interesting. That's actually one common interpretation. Anyone else? I'd like to tell you what I feel. It's a little, I, I agree. I feel weird. Uh, I, it's a feeling I'm not accustomed to. But then I went a little more and I said, well, okay, I'm going to bracket that out. I'm going to put that aside and say, well, what is it I'm feeling? And when I'm making her facial expression, you know what comes to my mind? I'm like a cat in the canary. I'm doing something sneaky. I know about it. No one else does. I'm pulling a joke. That's what comes to mind. That's the feeling I get. Like, I know something. It's so almost like a smirk. Like, I know something. You don't. What do you know? You know, I have a feeling where this is going. What? I was going to say almost like a plotting facial expression. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yup, yup. Now, this is interesting because it opens up a whole other can of worms. Do you remember you think from the part? Oh. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. A bean on Tuesday. My goodness. This is horrible. Because that's one I should know. Damn it. Sorry. A bean. Did you say there was something? One of the two of you mentioned something that there was, that he could, that this person could be smart enough. What's that? There's a sense of stay. Something sneaky might be going on. Do you remember? Which one of you said it? And I said, oh. That's it. Is it Leonardo as a woman? The actual painter doing a self-portrait of himself as a woman. He nailed it. Now that would be something to smirk about, wouldn't it? <laughs> Maybe that's what to smirk about. I don't know. I don't know. Um, incidentally, uh, Sigmund Freud, who we're going to go into depth about, wrote a whole book on Leonardo da Vinci. And his, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Did a psychoanalysis of Da Vinci that might tie into this whole thing. So, question, so now you get this idea of the hypothesis testing. The idea that I presented in my research class was, who was right here? Is there evidence for Leonardo or evidence for Margaret, Margaret Livingstone? I didn't mention the phenomenological stuff. I just told you on this as a side note because at that time I didn't know about it in my master's degree. I, I was yet to get turned on to phenomenology. If I were doing it now, I would have done this. Um, so what I did was I set up an experiment. When you do research, you have to have research methods. So what did we just talk about? Research methods. You have to come have some kind of methodology to, to come up with evidence, proof. And these research methods, there's many of them. And as I said before, the most, the, the king of all that all psychologists want to try to do is experimental research. But that's only a small portion of the actual research because it's very difficult to do experimentation. It doesn't work with a lot of human phenomena, with emotions, and because a lot of things aren't measurable or observable. A lot of, like, how do you measure emotion? How do you measure a dream? How do you measure an internal state? I mean, you might say on a scale of a Likert scale is one way. You know, you might say on a scale of one to five, how happy are you? But how do you know what your five is and what my five is? You know, does everyone have the same five? Does everyone have the same zero? Like, it gives the illusion that there's some kind of number to be processed. But you really don't know, and you're trusting that the number means something. So in research methods, the experiment is very difficult to do. So there are other methods. We broadly categorize these into qualitative methods, qualitative research methods, and quantitative.
quantitative, quantity, how measured, how many, qualitative, quality, what, what's it like? So a quantitative method uses numbers, math, and a qualitative uses description, descriptive words. Now just based on that, this phenomenological method that I told you about, this little game we did where we tried to imitate two of your feelings, do you think that's qualitative method or quantitative? Phenomenal, the little phenomenological research we did where we imitated the facial expression and then reported what we felt when we did this. It's quality. Should, how many think it's quality? How many think it's quantitative? How many don't you know? <laughs> it's quality. Good job. You got it. Why? Because it's talking about quality. You weren't saying, what are you feeling? 17. <laughs> what are you feeling? 32. You know, you were saying, I feel weird, I feel sneaky, you know, I feel, you're using qualities, not numbers. So qualitative research always offers a description. What are some qualitative research methods? Well, here are a few. You can have naturalistic observation. Naturalistic observation. This means you go out on the college campus and you observe people and you look for evidence to either support or reject your hypothesis. Do you remember I told you about my one of my role models, Nicholas Humphrey, going into the jungle in Rwanda to observe the gorillas in their natural habitat? That's naturalistic observation. He didn't do an experiment. He went and he observed and he as you can see out of the study, we go out and observe people in the cafeteria. We observe people at the shopping center. If you have the technology, you can observe people on in, uh, where they go after from website to website. Google tests all the time. They make subtle changes on their search engine that they'll give to a certain number of people and another version to another amount of people, and they see what's like shifting the color of the blue in Google slightly or shifting the results slightly, or where they place it in the ad results slightly, and see which, how it affects the behavior in each group. So you can, that's more of an experiment, but that's observation. You can observe digitally, even virtually, as well as in the natural world. There's another type of descriptive qualitative research. This is called participant observation. I love this one. Participant. This is when you secret, secretly join something and pose as a member of the group, but you're really a psychologist, psychological researcher. I, I teach a course called Social Psychology Occasion. In that course, I'm using a book by a social psychologist named Robert Cialdini. Cialdini was brilliant, is brilliant. He did, slight, he did participant observation, and he learned a lot of insights into things like being a car salesman. So he's a social psychologist, and he wanted to learn how car salesmen, or magazine salesmen, any type of salesman, how they manipulated people to say yes to their requests. So he went and applied for a job as a car salesman. He got the job. They don't know that he's a professor of psychology in Tempe, Arizona, or Arizona Tempe. They have no idea about this. And he's going to all their sales classes. He's learning all the tricks of the trade, all the ways to get people to say yes to that little extra in the car. Oh, you're going to need this. And oh, don't forget about this. We're going to send, uh, I'm going to go in the back and see if I can work these numbers with our financer. Learn the, the tricks of this book. Psychology of influence, what's really going on in the background. The deal's already done. They're making you wait. Do you remember this one if you go to the car to any car so you even knew? Do you promise me if we work on this, you'll leave today with the car? If I can get this to work for you, will you leave today with the car? 
Cialdini tells us that's answer no to that question every time. Because once you make that social commitment, you're about to make a path. You're about to probably spend more on that car than you should be spending. Always go home and take it out first. Oh, well, this is going to be someone else that's coming in at five to look at it. You're going to lose out. Chances are they're wrong. If you're not, chances are it's a tactic. So Chalpini learned all of these tactics by participating in their training programs, by posing and actually working in them. So I want to tell you a quick little story about participant observation. When I first started teaching, I got my master's degree and I was teaching, I got asked to, I got scheduled to write to teach a social psychology course at ESU, East Stroudsburg University. It was my, my, my first teaching gigs. It was my first teaching. And um, wasn't making a lot of money. And things were tight. I had my rent to pay and all this stuff. And one of the classes that was scheduled didn't get enough census, didn't get enough students to sign up. And suddenly I was depending on paying my rent and the class didn't run. So I wasn't getting that money for that semester. I'm just out, I'm a young guy, just out. I didn't have, so what I did was I looked on the what ads and I saw that somebody down in Lehigh Valley in Allentown, Bethlehem area, was looking for a telemarketer. And I got the job. So get this. In the morning I'm teaching social psychology about Cialdini and participant observation. And at night, because I really need the money to meet my expenses. I'm working, calling people to sell rental properties in the Berkshires. <laughs> you know? Hot, wait, what did you say? I said, no, you went. No, upstate New York. Uh, it's it's New York. Oh, okay. You know, this place was in upstate New York, in Berkshire, uh, the Berkshire Mountains. That was one of the things I learned. It's not Shire, it's Shire, it's Berkshire Mountains. And if you start to sound, if you're calling someone and you're from the South, and you're calling them the South, it helps if you make your voice a little more relaxed. Sorry to bother you this evening. So suddenly, I'm teaching it in the morning and doing it at night. Do you know, I'm very proud to tell you, I'm not a salesman, but after one month of working in that job, I was salesman of the month, and I was so excited. You know what my, my reward was? I made the most sales in my first month in that month. I, what's that? I got a vacation? No. I got to leave 15 minutes early. That was, that was the big reward. I had never, yeah, that was the reward I got. So then I, then I did that for one semester. I learned so much, but I had so much rich uh, material to give the students the next morning because I was using it that night. That's participant observation. I was learning the tricks of the trade, but I really needed to do it. But I is also putting the knowledge to, to work. So that's participant observation. Questions? Another qualitative research method, a survey. Asking people what's their response. Hey, here's the uh, Mona Lisa painting. How does, what do you think she's smiling about? Survey. Maybe give a survey where you can actually check a box for forced answers. Maybe use a Likert scale. On a scale of one to five, what do you think, you know? Isn't that quantitative, though? Once you use a Likert scale, it becomes quantitative, yeah. Yeah, it's good, good, good. So, so there's a way to quantify some of this stuff. You can always start counting. That's when it becomes quantitative. Qualitative, this is great, thank you. The qualitative is when you're just giving quality report. People say this. When you start saying 90% of people say this, now you're doing quantitative, you're doing quantitative analysis of a qualitative research. <laughs> See? That's good. So these are the qualitative method. Quantitative. It's going to use numbers, statistics, in other words. That's why you have to study so much statistics in psychology. And the two big ones for this is correlational studies, which we'll look at next time, and experimental studies, which I used for the Mona Lisa study, which I will tell you about more. If I'm not mistaken, we're about done now, right? 540, yeah? 
we're done. Um, and quantitative, another quantitative analysis is any type of neuroimaging. So looking at fMRIs, brain scans, MRIs, PET scans, all that stuff, that's also quantitative because it's measurable and observable. You can measure it. Yeah. Correlational? C O R R. Correlation. And experimental is the other word. And I'm going to, for about 15 minutes in the next class, I'm going to tell you what those are. And I'm going to tell you what I did with the Mona Lisa stuff. Questions, thoughts? All right. Thank you for your attention and have a great afternoon. <laughs> bye bye. See you Wednesday. Bye bye.